Good evening, this is Dr. McDaniel. It is, let's see, well, it's 8.58. So a little bit later today, we had a lot of work, uh, quite a few patients this afternoon, so, and this evening mostly, evening hours are always pretty busy. So I'm a little later than I thought I was going to be. Yesterday, I think it was around 7.45, 7.50 or so, but it will usually be after the evening hours. Um, tomorrow's Friday, and Friday we have early day. The last appointment's 1.45, so tomorrow it will probably be around 3 or 4 o'clock. And let's see, today's the second day of my daily live postings. I'm going to try to do a daily post every day for a year. That's my goal. And I'm going to try to keep the post to around 10 minutes, maybe 15 at the most. Uh, I had stated I wanted to do kind of a backstory, an origin story for why I'm a physician. I'm a gynecologist in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I've been practicing for tw almost 27 years now, since 1993. So I wanted to do a backstory, why I became a doctor, where I'm from, that kind of information. I will probably have to cut it into two or three parts to just keep my limit of the 10 to 15 minute post, but we'll see. So as I stated, I'm from Seattle, Washington. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, but my dad was from Seattle and uh, they moved back to Seattle when I was uh, a little under a year old, around nine or 10 months old. So I grew up in Seattle. I went to the University of Washington for undergraduate, that's four years. And I went to the University of Washington Medical School for medical school, that's also four years. Um, my impetus to become a physician really started in grade school. Uh, I remember specifically around 10 years old, we know when you're growing up, everyone asks you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And before I was 10, I always said I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, I wanted to teach and I used to teach my little brother and cousins and such little things. And we'd play school, of course. So I wanted to be a teacher for the longest. And then around 10 years old, I remember we did a project in science class and it had to be a project on technology or something. And I chose uh, ultrasonography and its use in medicine, specifically in um, prenatal surgeries and operations. I was at 10 years old and I thought it was amazing that um, I mean, it's still amazing when you think about that physicians or gynecologists specifically, maternal fetal medicine doctors were able to operate on the unborn child. So they were doing a laparoscopic uh, and a mini laparotomy procedures on pregnant women to specifically at that time to reverse hydrocephalus or water on the brain, to put shunts in in utero so that these babies before they were born would not have a large head, hydrocephalus. So that sparked awe. And um, over time, probably over the, after that, I kept saying I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to operate on babies before they were born. But over time, I really thought about it. And um, I, I think at the time I wanted to be a doctor because I remember thinking science and technology were amazing and fascinating. I wanted to be a part of that sounded interesting and exciting. And um, so kind of the, the outward or the, the, the surface reason was medicine and it's exciting. That was part of the reason. But when I look back, I think a, a deeper part of it was also like anybody in the Sister Sue, almost if you think anybody can be a teacher. Uh, teachers are a dime a dozen and they're not really respected as much as they should be. And they don't get paid very much. So you always hear about teacher salaries and um, people just take teachers for granted and just the respect and the, the income and the level of expertise. Just, I think internally, I just thought that's not really where I wanna go. And of course, not anybody can be, a, anyone can be a teacher, but not anyone can be a really good teacher. And as a side note, of course, I think teachers should get paid a lot more money. Um, they do a lot of work and they're dealing with a lot of people's young lives in their hands. 
and the respect still is not there for teachers that we should give teachers. But at the time, this is what, 30, 40 years ago, I think I really veered towards medicine because I thought, okay, I'll get the respect. Everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody. Most people respect their physicians uh, for high level of intelligence and for the dedication it takes to be a, a doctor and for the dedication it takes to be a good doctor and to put the hours and the time in and the effort in. So at the time I thought, well, I wanna get paid a lot of money, doctors make a lot of money, and I want people to respect me because I'm really smart, I wanna show I'm really smart, and I want that level of respect. So that was part, that was the internal impetus for it, and the external was, yeah, science is cool, I could do a lot of amazing things. Uh, so it's kind of a yin and a yang. It was an internal that I didn't really, hadn't really focused on or acknowledged. And then the external was science is great and I can always help people. Uh, as the years went by, yes, uh, I went through the university. I went through medical school. University of Washington is an awesome medical school. We got, uh, we were kind of really on the cutting edge back then with anatomy and integrative health care. Uh, I really enjoyed medical school, and I guess uh, for me, medical school wasn't difficult. So I, uh, I know I'm very smart. I, I don't think I'm Einstein, but I know I'm smart and I can catch on. So medical school for me, everyone's always, oh my God, medical school is difficult. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of work. If you're good at memorizing things, which most of us are, that's why we made it into medical school. It's not hard, as long as you set aside the time, you have good study skills, you can memorize things, you'll do well in medicine. Now that being said, of course, not everyone's a good doctor because part of being a good doctor, as I've really reflected over the years, is being able to empathize with people, to put yourself in their shoes, and to give them the advice that you would want someone to give you or a loved person. Not everyone does that. I've found over the years, I've met a lot of doctors who do not care. They told me that, I don't care. They don't care about the people they're supposed to be working with and treating. They don't care if that person understands what the issues is. They don't care if that person takes their advice, takes the medicine. They just don't care and it's really sad. I always put myself in the patient's shoes when there's um, a problem what I would want someone to tell me and I try to, to explain things on a very very basic level to people you know they always say that the news is broadcasted at a third grade level I try to explain things on a third grade level use very simple words not because I think people are stupid but I also think that when people are dealing with doctors they're very stressed out and their comprehension when they're stressed is very very low Half of it doesn't really filter through. I write everything out when I'm talking to them. So I think um, if you're smart, yeah, being a doctor, you have to be smart. Everyone's smart. And you have to be able to memorize very easily. But part of it also is you have to be able to communicate with people and to empathize and to be sympathetic for people's plights. So I feel like I'm able to do that. So through the process, Looking back, I chose the right the right profession, the right career to go into because I do have the intellect to work with medicine and science and it's always changing. You always have to keep up. That was part of the, the 10 year old me wanted to pick a field that wasn't stagnant. I wanted to go into medicine because it's dynamic. It's always changing. You have to keep up. You have to stay on the cutting edge. You have to be able to process the, the information, the technology that comes along. And at the end of the day, 40 years later, I, I am able to do that. So I chose the right career. Um, that being said, um, the path through medical school was easy, but what you don't realize you're doing as a, a 10 or 11 or 12 year old when you pick medicine and you start going towards that pathway, you don't realize that you're making a trade-off. You can never get something for nothing. So the trade-off uh, was you're putting your social life on hold. You're putting yourself into a big, big ditch, a big, big, deep hole as far as 
finances go because most of us aren't weren't independently wealthy when we entered medical school. We didn't have wealthy parents who would pay for it. I had working class, middle class parents. So my dad was the only one who worked. My mother didn't work. She was a stay-at-home mother. She worked here and there just intermittently for like vacation money or something like that. We didn't go on a, a lot of vacations. We went on a, a few over the years and they were great. They were nice. But my parents had to work. I had to pay for my own education. They helped where they could with books and things. But I had to take out loans. So that was a big financial uh, deficit. So it's a trade-off, um, sacrifices and hardships as far as money goes and as far as life goes because I didn't have a lot of uh, heavy socialization. I didn't get married till I was 35. Was I 35? Yeah, I was 35 and I got married. Didn't have my children till late. You know, I come from my mother. She had me at 18, my brother 22, 23, young mommy. I remember when I was 10, so oh, my, my, my mother's 28, very young. Uh, I didn't have my kids till old lady, so what was I, 30, 36, 37, 38, and 42. I have four children, so I had them all late uh, in life. So you put everything on hold when you go into medicine. Was it worth it? Um, it is, I felt it was, to me it was worth it because I'm in a career that I like, I enjoy. Uh, but I did find over, over time, I had to carve out a life that I liked in medicine. So I had a, a colleague of mine years ago, he said, life's too short to be unhappy and there's too many options in medicine to feel stuck. So I chose to go into obstetrics gynecology, which unbeknownst to me when I made that choice in medical school, I guess I didn't really think about it. It's not an easy life. It's a very difficult life because you're dealing with pregnant patients all the time and women going into labor or having catastrophes. So you're on 24 seven call. You can't really have a life if you're a fully dedicated ob -gen. So, and I like to, I still like ob -gen. the medicine and, the, the work you're doing, it's very rewarding, uh, and it's a lot of fun, but it has the yin and the yang. So that's the yin, the yang is malpractice insurance rate is through the roof. It's out of control. And next to neurosurgeons, ob Gen has the highest rate of malpractice and lawsuits, so it's a very stressful field. Uh, there's a lot of, um, what they call it? burnout. There's a lot of burnout in medicine, and OBGYN is right up at the top with the burnout. So the malpractice insurance coverage alone is around anywhere from, well, it's six figures. It's around 150 to $250,000 a year, so it's ridiculous. So I carved it out, I stopped OB, even though I felt I was really good obstetrician, patients always gave me really excellent feedback. I stopped doing obstetrics, it's too time consuming, it's very demanding. A lot of people don't wanna do OB now because of the demands, the time, effort, no family life. So I cut out obstetrics years ago. I stopped doing obstetrics, doing deliveries and, and working with pregnant women past the first trimester. I stopped that in 2005 was the last delivery I did because I, no, 2004, because I was pregnant with my first child. Uh, the last delivery I did, I was seven months pregnant. That was it. And then I stopped doing the GYN surgeries. And that was a fun part too, because you go to the operating room, you do laparoscopic, camera surgery, do opens, you do hysterectomies, moving cysts, mass fibroids, tumors. Um, that's a lot of fun. I like being in the operating room, but again, it takes a lot of time away. I'm schlepping over to the hospital, leaving the office. So I've whittled it down to something I'm very comfortable with, and that's GYN, what we call bread and butter GYN. So staying in the office, I work nine to five, sometimes a little, some days a little longer, like Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays are usually my late days. But I start at 10.45, I finish at 6.45, I stay later to do some paperwork or you know, paperwork, everything's on the computer now. 
Fridays are short days. Last appointment's 1.45, I start at 10.45. So I've carved out my little niche. So it's basically a nine to five, Monday through Friday. I have four kids, so I'm able to get them off breakfast, get them off to school in the morning, come home and have my weekend. So I was able to carve that out. And um, I mean, it's true, life's too short to be unhappy and there's too many options to not be able to make a niche for yourself. So I feel like I've been able to overcome those obstacles that could have been really huge obstacles, being unhappy, walking out of the home at two in the morning to do deliveries or for catastrophes. I've been able to, to eliminate those aspects and be really happy with the situation that I've been able to carve out. Uh, that's going to be part one because I realize I've been rattling, 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 and it's almost 9.15, so this has been going on a lot longer than I wanted it to. Uh, I had said that I would finish each, each post every day uh, with kind of a recap and something uh, informative or educational or something that happened in the office today. So I guess the recap was I came from Seattle, why I wanted to be a doctor, and um, some of the the known and unknown hurdles of being a doctor, how I overcame that, how I carved out a niche, and then tomorrow I will go into, um, after I finished uh, medical school residency, bit how I came to New York, and um, what I see as a, kind of how my path in life is going to go uh, from now. This 26 years of medicine, I'm getting old. Uh, what I'm going to finish today, we saw quite a few people today. Nothing, I mean, everything mostly is very little that I haven't seen. It's bread and butter. Uh, I will say today the take home message patient I'm going to bring up is going to be, um, I guess, I'm thinking of two or three people. It's horrible. I'm thinking of two or three people. One, I'm going to say something that I've seen come up quite often, and that's going to be, uh, I saw a patient today, she's 23, and she has a, um, a little lump or a small nodule, a small little bump growth on her thyroid. And uh, I've seen a lot of patients over the years with thyroid nodules, and uh, a lot of them in their 20s with thyroid nodules end up having cancer thyroid cancer. Of course, we don't know that in advance. All we know at the time is they have a lump on their thyroid. And this has come up several times. So this patient I saw today, um, I hadn't seen her in a little over a year. And in the interim, she'd seen her primary care, she'd seen two primary care doctors. She said she didn't like the first one. And the reason she said she didn't like the first one is because the first one did the physical exam, told her she had an, a small growth or two small nodules or growths on her thyroid. And she said she didn't like the first one because she told her she needed all this work done and she needed a biopsy and it really scared her. So, of course, she got a second opinion. She saw another doctor who told her, no, you had your bloods done for your thyroid. They were fine. You had a sonogram done for your thyroid. It looks fine. You don't need the biopsy. You just follow up and um, I think they told her in a year for another sonogram. So, she said she didn't like the first one because it's like chicken little, sky's falling. But I told her... Obviously, I don't know how the first doctor delivered it. You know, there's a way to tell people news and there's a way not to tell people news. You can freak them out or you can just deliver the information so they understand why it's important to you and why they should have it done. Not because they're going to die tomorrow, they have stage four cancer, but just medicine is a process and you have to start with the basics and you work yourself up for the evaluation. If you don't get a solid answer, you have to keep going, going until you get a solid answer. So I told her um, that's really not the best advice not to get a biopsy. I'm not going to say the sky is falling, but the first doctor, even though maybe the delivery wasn't great, the first doctor was correct. You should get a biopsy. Simply stated because when it comes to thyroid nodules, the bloods can be normal even if someone has cancer. The thyroid panel can be normal. The sonogram can look benign even if someone has cancer. So when it comes to nodules, if it's a liquid, if it's a cyst, you don't have to aspirate that. You don't have to sample if it looks pretty simple. You can monitor it with a sono every 
six months is what most most people would recommend that's reasonable if there's something quite off about it then even assist the liquid should be drained to, to evaluate the little cells from the skin layer that fall into the liquid to confirm it's benign if it's a, a mass a growth a nodule that's a solid tissue and in my experience that should always be at least aspirated a little needle in a little needle thrown in to suck off a few of the cells to get a, an idea what the actual diagnosis is because blood work doesn't tell you 100 percent someone doesn't have a, at least a borderline or a full-blown cancer looking at the sonogram that's just telling you what it looks like it doesn't tell you 100 percent what it is it tells you what it looks like so what it most likely is but it's not a solid diagnosis you need tissue for a diagnosis and when it's a solid tumor I've had a good number of patients over the years who look bloods were fine sonogram looked benign but they remembered I told them they should have it sampled they get it sampled and of course it turns out to be cancer they need thyroid removed that's a big deal and if it were me I wouldn't want to trust just a reporter oh it looks normal it looks normal because what's going to happen if it's not normal it grows it starts to look abnormal oh sorry it looked normal a year or two ago sorry it's there's no guarantees in life now you have cancer so we're all as I like to say we're always looking for cancer and hoping we don't find it and it's always best to be safe than sorry so I I told her I felt she should get a biopsy that the first doctor was correct there's no harm in getting a biopsy and finding out you were right it's benign you should be happy it's benign but if it's not benign then at least you have that information in advance early when you can address it you can treat it and then you can skip along so the take-home message for today is as we used to say in in gyn when in doubt cut it out so you don't have to cut it out but you need to sample it to get a tissue diagnosis to know 100 percent what it is not say it it looks it looks normal on the sauna so thyroid masses if it's not liquid it's tissue it's solid it's not a cyst then it should you should have your bloods done you should have a sonogram to characterize it and you should have that tissue sample to see exactly what it is and then you can monitor it if it's nothing all right sorry for going on i think i've actually been going on for half an hour i didn't realize i could talk so much all right so this is dr mcdaniel I'm in Midtown Manhattan, New York City, uh, Midtown Gynecology. Have a good night. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2019. And if all goes well, I'll post again earlier tomorrow, Friday. Thank you.